interested, I'll let you know. Okay, thanks. My okay. pleasure. Okay, go on. Everybody doing good today? Aloha Friday. Happy Aloha Friday. It's Aloha Friday. And it's sunshine. Happy, happy fourth quarter. Let's go. Fourth no, quarter. Right? We are in. Well, it's crazy because this year in some ways feels like it's been a really slow year because of COVID. But then at the same time, you're like, oh, it's October. And once October hits, you know, Costco, they put out all their Christmas trees. So you're like, oh, it's Christmas already. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> fast year for sure but good stuff it's going to be a good it's going to be a good ending of a good year for sure well um should we just get started we'll just do a little uh, we got daniel back because everybody learned so much and there was so much more that we wanted to talk about with daniel so he's going to talk about some of his uh, additional insights and secrets and stuff like that so that'll be pretty fun uh, so daniel thank you for being back you're amazing we're, uh, we're waiting. We all have our notepads and pens out. We're going we're gonna to be educated and inspired to all go to the Midwest. <laughs> but before we do that, we're going to, a um, couple of things that we wanted to just chat about. First, uh, Corey always facilitates the needs, deeds, good deeds, and weeds. I, I can never get that right. <laughs> <laughs> you take it, Bob. What, what's, Wrong what's call, up? bro. Wrong call. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, thanks everybody for jumping on again Friday. Hopefully everyone had a great week. Um, we had some wins, you know, sold some properties, uh, making yes. some, you know, some deals. So um, I guess let's start because uh, uh, I, I want to bring on Daniel again. There's so much great information from uh, last week that we asked him if he could continue the conversation because uh, he actually had some more tips on the financing side as well. Um, so before we hand it over to Daniel, um, why don't we talk about our leads, needs, and good deeds? So does anybody have any leads? I know we had, uh, as I was talking with Scott kind of before we started, um, we have a deal out in the Big Island in Hilo. It's a short sale, and it's coming from one of our capital partners. And so they, they'll call us whenever they have you know deals that are kind of distressed right now, and, and they can't, you know, make any moves on it they just want to do the loans right they're they're money guys but you know we're also investors as well so there's uh we have a deal out in hilo um big island hey, one, Corey, not to interrupt you that i just got a call on it from okay. the agent that the agent that's actually handling she has a buyer on it already oh okay but the gotcha. second i get these i will give it out on our website i mean on, on our facebook page as well on keiko exchange as soon as something like this pops up so keep your eyes open Everyone. Okay. Scratch that. <laughs> Too late. Um, so does anybody have anything uh, or any wins, any good deeds? That's always nice to hear too, to close out the week. Uh, I got all three, a lead, a need, and a good deed. Uh, start with a good deed. Uh, our project just went live. Uh, it was my partnership with Dustin. Uh, that was an exciting project, a condo out in Honolulu. So uh, definitely happy and grateful for him taking me under his wing and teaching me and definitely want to do more deals with them. So that was definitely a good deed. It definitely feels good to get a, get a project under my belt. So Congratulations, yeah, man. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so um, yeah, then I have a lead, uh, my friend, he's a real estate agent. So he has a, a guy, he's an investor. Um, super private, unfortunately. So the information that I have is um, he's looking for a short-term investor, uh, needs 150,000 for rehab, uh, willing to uh, give a 5% ROI and it's a two week turn time. So you get your money back in two weeks with a 5% uh, return on your money. Um, if you have any like additional questions, um, I can connect you with my friend. He's the agent. Um, that's his uh, client. And I got a few pictures of the actual project. Um, so yeah, that's the lead there. And then uh, if anyone has uh, any rooms for rent, a friend of mine needs to find another place. Uh, so she's looking anywhere on the island. Her budget is about 650. So yeah, if you anyone has an extra room with some cash flow for that, yeah, 650. 650. 
Okay. Ashley has a house in Wahiwa. She's got some roommates. Ashley might be able to rent her an entire house and she can uh, <laughs> make some positive. <laughs> Thanks, That's Shawana. That's great to know. Not a bad idea, right, Ashley? Room rent it. Do a boarding house. You'll make more money. Well, Ashley has a need. Ashley's looking for a renter. It's a four bedroom house though with an office. So maybe a little bit bigger than, than she wants. But I have a studio for 1400 as well, but maybe if she rents it, she can just sure. pay 650. Mm. Cutting a deal, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> right on Javon, thanks for sharing, man. Maybe I should start calling on people, yeah? Be, I think we got to start doing that. Everybody's just shame. It's Friday, it's Friday morning, your time, Friday afternoon, our time, and Pauhana on the East Coast. So we're all over the board around here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all good. Hey, I have something about? for everybody. I actually have a need, if I can go. Hey, Stacy. Hey, Stacy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Stacy. I'm looking for a real estate attorney um, in Hawaii. I have a property that I'm trying to purchase and it has tenants in it. So I'm trying to get my mom to serve them out before I buy them, before, before I buy the property. So if anyone has an attorney, that'd be awesome. I think Daniel, didn't you have a one that you recommended last week? No, you had a CPA. Uh, Daniel's on mute. But if anybody has an attorney in Hawaii that you recommend, throw them in the chat. For Stacy. So you need an attorney for like kind of like to draft an eviction letter or something. Yeah, um, kind of just the whole process. My partner is in SoCal, so she just wants to make we want to make sure we know all the laws, obviously, before mm -hmm. doing. Yeah, especially now. Yeah. Did they miss that moratorium yet, or no? No. no. Washington has a really interesting um, situation, similar moratorium as Hawaii, but interesting enough, if you're buying a property, the seller can actually give 60 day notice. And then the 60 day notice is because of a sale, which then does not apply with the moratorium, uh, the eviction moratorium. So it's a really interesting little loophole that we've discovered here. Uh, so our attorney's watching that very carefully in case that changes, but we've tested it out on two properties that we just closed on in Seattle area, and it looks like it so far is working. So check that out, Stacy, and see if Hawaii may be following suit on a similar type loophole, uh, because that could be your way before you close on it. You haven't closed on it yet, yeah? Or you did? Okay, so before you close on it, that might be something that could be because of a sale, the seller is getting somebody out. And yeah, the, the loop the loophole for Hawaii is once you purchase the if if they're on a month to month, once you purchase the property, then you can serve the forty five day notice. Oh, after you close on it as a new owner, you can serve them forty five. Yeah, but then how's that how's that relate to the moratorium then? Because um, right now you, you can't serve the forty five day notice either if you're on a month to month or you can't you can't evict. I'll, I'll, I'll put the reference in the chat. Interesting. Huh, that's cool. That's actually uh, even easier. Hey, Stacey, Thank you, I appreciate that. Stacy, Kevin Mizuno, mahalo Kevin, uh, put Ken Lau on there. Oh yeah, right. Stacy, just a thought, have you like tried to talk to the, I mean, are you allowed to talk to the tenants and see if they'll take cash for keys? I mean, that might be like a, even a cheaper way or like a less headache way it's for you to get them out like uh depending on what their situation is yeah i've already talked to them um i don't think it's going to be a problem getting them out they are they're already trying to look for new places we just want to make sure we're doing everything legally just in case That's smart gives us back, back are they good tenants or no are they what are they good tenants yeah they're really good tenants they've been there for the past 20 years there actually is no lease it's mm. just them paying. 20 years? So how much have Wine they style right there. What? How much do they pay in rent? <laughs> <laughs> they pay nothing. They pay, I think 
the three bedroom one bath is eleven hundred bucks a month. Wow. It's a triplex, so there's three different units. Um, but the back house is eleven hundred. Wow. That's a good deal. Corey like move in. <laughs> or maybe uh that guy's friend. Javon, your friend needs a place. Uh try get Stacy's information. <laughs> no, I'm I'm trying to buy it. <laughs> Perfect. No, that's great. Thanks, uh, Kevin, for uh, the information. Oh, yeah. So Tomas brings up a great point. If th so if there's no lease, wouldn't they technically be considered squatters? You don't want to do that, though, right? Because they've been great. Yeah, great exactly. Exactly. I, I want to just play it safe. Yeah, right. Now, if you can keep your relationship with your tenants healthy, then they don't become adversarial. And so that's the key with, with uh, tenants. We, our property management company has tried really hard to be proactive on the relationship building with the tenants. And, and it's, sometimes it's just a really bad situations. And especially if people don't really want to move out, they've been there forever, they feel like you're actually kicking them out of their home. And that's just really rough. So relationship is important. You're doing it the right way, Stacey. Thanks. I got a, that brings up a question for me. Like, are you, do you guys think is the rental market becoming more competitive as well right now? Or is it dead? Which market are you talking about? Where you're at. Because since there's a moratorium and, you know, like people aren't really moving, are they? Oh, there's a lot of movement out of like big cities like New York. So yeah, LA. I guess it does matter. What market. Out of LA. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of movement. San Francisco, all Northern California is pretty much on fire. People are out of there. Oh, that's still going, huh? Do we have anybody from Northern California? Penny. Yeah, I, I'm in the South Bay. I'm in Santa Clara County. Um, rental market, I mean, in terms of rental prices, they're obviously going down because there's mass exodus um, of people who can work remotely and their employers are going to, going to accommodate them from working remotely. But at the same time, people who are staying put, they're taking advantage and mm -hmm. get home with kids trying to work their jobs so they're looking for more space or just something more comfortable so i think it's a little bit of both mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's interesting that's great to know are you is, are you guys okay are you far far from the yeah the just um air quality is horrible it's like the third day where we've had um i think it's like 160 today wow. so you're not really wanting to go out um it's it's mostly the fires are in the in napa county so it's far enough where we're not concerned about fire threat, but the air quality is really poor. It's mm -hmm. really bad. That's it's another terrible. reason people are leaving. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Penny. Yeah. You're welcome. Awesome. Anybody else got a, a need of any kind? Anybody got a challenge that you're trying to sort through? I have a need. Um, I have an investor we're working on a big loan with. It's actually a pretty good opportunity for whoever wants to jump on it um we're looking for three hundred seventy-five thousand to four hundred thousand dollars uh the loan would be for about three quarters um and you'll get a 10 percent return and one percent equity in the project uh this project already has about 220 units complete and the next phase will be coming soon. So he right now out of the 220, 200 are leased. Um, once the val property is completely complete, the as is value will be about 105 million. Right now it's about 80 in its current market, but it's just a, it's a short term bridge. The client needs to uh, satisfy his partners on another buyout. So, so is that anyone's interested in annual? Me, 10% annual uh, or 10% straight? 10% uh, it'd be an annualized return, but it'd be based off of the three quarters. So probably nine months is what he's requesting. 
on the loan, but the takeout will be a HUD loan. And when the HUD loan happens, that would be when we get paid off, whoever was interested in doing this. Uh, what, where is it, New Jersey? It is in New Jersey, yes. Uh, um, On a project called Woodbridge. I have an appraisal, I have everything, if anyone's interested in it. Sweet, yeah, that's actually a good project. Um. Uh, can you, you talk about your, your radio? You What's that? Maybe that's a Jeremy and Kevin thing. Jeremy and Kevin. Uh, yeah, I reached out. Oh yeah. Or, I, yeah. I reached out. I reached out to them. Uh, okay. We're gonna see. Nice. Uh, can I drop your email in the chat so in case anybody is interested for you know the appraisal and additional information they can reach out. To them. I'd rather spread it out on the back end. If he's giving one percent, have you calculated that? Well, 1% of 104 million, right. pretty, pretty easy, pretty good pickup for 400 grand, yep. 375 is the going rate right now, but yeah. That's 1.14 million plus your 10% interest on your 375. So, but when is the refi, how long to the, for the, for the takeout on the refi? You're looking at probably nine months max. Nine months. No, so. That's a pretty good return so long as everything appraisal value and everything checks out. We gotta think about this. <laughs> if the well, hey, Alex, you have the appraisal. Everything's in already on it, Kakola. Phenomenal borrow. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I have everything. Yeah. That's awesome. So wait, so one percent return, ten percent annualized, three fifty initial investment. 1% equity in the project. 1% equity. Project. Wow. Yeah, it's a big that's, project. Yeah, that's pretty good. I like it. We'll be, uh, we are, uh, um, this is one of our big loans that's going through, guys. So we'll be involved as well, whether we do the, you know, the debt or the bring in 375. I'm kind of liking this. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. So, so just to reiterate what Corey's saying is that for anybody who's kind of interested in this deal, but you're not sure about New Jersey and you're not sure about partnering in on a deal with somebody you don't know. So our company, Keiko Capital, is going to be doing the funding for the project overall. So what's the overall amount of money on the loan, Alex? Uh, on this loan, we're, the takeout loan is going to be, you know, probably 100, or no, 80, 85 to 95 million would be so, our takeout. For a HUD okay. loan. And then what are we going to loan them? What do they need for the start? Uh, we're looking right now at doing a, a bridge loan on this project uh, and cross collateralizing it on another development we're doing with him for 20 million right now. Perfect. So basically um, it, it, your confidence, if anybody's interested is the fact that we're going to do a ton of underwriting and we already know these folks on a bigger project in New Jersey that we're funding. So uh, we'll be able to help do the due diligence just to make sure it's a, a solid deal. But yeah, that's a pretty good return. I like it. Corey, you got an extra 300000 we could spend? Uh, <laughs> 1.14 million? I'm sure we can. I'm sure we have that. Yeah, that's a pretty good return. But, but, uh, okay, never mind. Alex, I was going to ask you a question about it, but... Hey, let's, uh, let's transition really quick. I want to get to Daniel, but um, we've all had lots of texts have gone around today. I don't know if anybody else is texting your friends. Obviously, the news hit that uh, our president's got COVID. Uh, all of the um, stocks fell, Dow fell. You know, today's just been a really interesting day overall, and there's lots of speculation as to exactly what that means. You look at what happened with uh, uh, Prime Minister Boris Yeltsin. Did I say his name right? He got COVID, right? And then he fortunately, he got it right at the start in March. Fortunately, uh, was not impacted too tremendously. Um, at least, you know, he's alive. Uh, but that still yet left a huge mark during that season of uncertainty. So there's definitely some uncertainty happening now surrounding that. Uh, I thought we'd just kind of talk a little bit about that since that's kind of what we like to do is talk about hot topics. And um, by no means are any of us the experts, but it's just kind of, what are you thinking? What have you heard? I know, Alex, you were looking up some stuff too earlier and kind of following along. Um, but just curious, what's, uh, what's everybody kind of thinking and, and what's your response right now, if there is any response? Um, Alex, did you want to say anything on that piece? 
Yeah, I mean, I, my thing was just uh, how the market had slid so much, you know, between the Dow opening. I think the Dow dropped 350 points when it opened, and you had the NASDAQ, which was down 1.8%. So it looks like uh, people are a little worried with the market and where it's going to go with the uncertainty of, of how the next two weeks are going to play out with Trump's quarantine. So I'm just curious what everyone else kind of thinks. So they're not, they're going to keep going heavy into the market or pull back and switch over to real estate. That would be interesting. Well, <clears throat> I feel it's, it, it'll affect the stock market, but that is always happens. Whenever it's big news, you know, it, it, the market becomes volatile, but as for the housing market, I feel the only thing that we have to look out for is it like, since a lot of the financing and money comes from, you know, companies that ride the capital markets, if the capital markets are going down very fast, like it did in March, then it could start to affect the housing market, you know? So that's the thing I, I would say that we'd have to kind of just watch out for. So we do have to keep an eye on the market and then, you know, make some calls to whoever you're in touch with on the financing side. Yeah. Anybody else got some opinions on that? That's very interesting. <clears throat> hey, Troy, I, I don't want to pick on you. I don't know if you're on another conference call, but kind of from corporate sector world, uh, what's kind of, what are you hearing in your circle of uh, folks just relative to uh, the Trump situation with COVID, but then also now the impact on elections. They're talking about elections being moved a bit, you know, and obviously today unemployment rates were released and were down to set under 7% or under 8%. So that's pretty good. Um, but I'm just curious, Troy, if you've got any take on that. Yeah, I mean, nothing is, nothing, you know, is kind of hot off the press with, the, you know, the Trump news. I haven't talked to anyone in the last, uh, you, know, you know, 12 hours or so. But prior to that, I mean, there's, there's, you know, we obviously at, at Disney spend a lot of time kind of ramping up for the election. So there's, you know, specifically in the news space. And so there's definitely a, a lot of, um, a lot of questions and a little bit of anxiety, I think, kind of across the news organizations about how all this is going to go. Um, I also think, I mean, this is public information, but, you know, Disney announced yesterday, they're going to be laying off, you know, what, another 20 to 30,000 uh, more employees. Uh, mostly in kind of the parks and consumer you know, experiences, but that's pretty significant. So people are not back to normal by any stretch, um, even though they're trying to keep the parks open. So um, yeah, not, not great from kind of the big media perspective. Um, but I, but I do know that, you know, the company is still very much bullish. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge impact. I saw the news of Disney laying off 28,000 people. And, and what's really deceiving is that when you look at the unemployment rates, you know, so even though everyone's celebrating that we hit 14% at the peak and now we're down under eight and everyone's like, yay, we're getting better. The problem is, is that what that number doesn't include is everybody on furloughs. And so you've got, you know, gosh, so many companies, American airlines just furloughed, was it 28 or 29,000 as well yesterday? I mean, it just, staggering the people that are on furloughs that are just the first step towards unemployment. So that'll be interesting. Anybody else kind of, you know, got any thoughts on, you know, kind of more a government type president follower type that kind of has some thoughts about what uh, to be thinking about in this season. Yeah, yeah. Nobody like talking about politics. It's the one thing you're not supposed to talk about, right? You're not supposed <laughs> yeah. to talk about politics, uh, you know, but at the same time, I mean, this is kind of, we're in, uh, of all seasons, it's interesting. My thought on this is that one, it now uh, it brings a greater reality. I mean, Trump, I think one obviously is probably CNN, but one of the news uh, casts, I don't know exactly which one was saying that the, the, the single source of the most misinformation during this last season was Trump. And so he kept, uh, you know, misquoting things. But now that he's actually got COVID, I think it's going to bring a new level of attention to COVID. And so it's going to be interesting to see how the, that changes for his uh, information. But in terms of the economy, I think we're going to hear in the next couple of days, I mean, obviously, he's going to get great medical treatment. I think we're going to hear positive reports. They're going to obviously be like, he's fine, he's healthy. So hopefully, you know, that is going to be the truth. Where I think we watch for is that, 
I think there's going to be a greater sense of the government now doing more stimulus. So there's going to be probably in light of the changes for the elections, there's probably going to be bigger stimulus packages that are going to come out. What I would be concerned about is that, as everybody knows from an economic standpoint, the more stimulus money that hits that the government prints, the greater the impact on the value of the dollar, which then translates into inflation. So that would be something that I'm watching very carefully for, because if that happens and we go into a, a significant inflationary economy in 2021, then that's gonna, it's going to impact every industry um, more than it already has, right? And that'll definitely be interesting on uh, the real estate market. Although they've said, hey, we're going to hold on to uh, interest rates, you know, as long as possible and keep those down. You know, it's anyone's prediction. It's not like it's it's not like the Bible, right? It doesn't it doesn't state it. And it's never going to change. So even though they may want to hold interest rates, the concern is going to be like, what happens though? Um, you know, when inflation truly does catch up, because our value of our dollar has gone just tanked because we're we're printing more money. I can't remember exactly, but I'm pretty confident this is right, that we printed more money in the last 10 years just for the stimulus stuff than we had in prior times. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So um, Dante is saying hyperinflation is possible in the playbook. That's a good, that's a good comment. Hey, Dante, don't mean to pick on you, but for, for those of us who aren't as smart, what does hyperinflation mean? Hyperinflation is when um, the inflation amount goes higher than the usual. So instead of the 2% target, what they're aiming for, it'll go higher than that. So prices will go up dramatically. Yeah. Well, and inflation isn't always bad, though, you know, um, since we're already on a fiat system, uh, it's almost like they, I mean, they have to, you know, and the way they, they try to, they're trying to stabilize it now is by keeping the interest rates low. And that's why they're for the housing market. Um, at the beginning of this, I thought, Oh, there's no way we're making, making it out of this without, you know, taking a turn. But then I start to, when you hear the Fed saying that they're, they're not going to raise interest rates, they're going to keep their costs to, uh, you know, at zero per, zero percent, um, till 2023, uh, that's it's like because they have to right they have to and that's why i don't know about your guys markets but our market here in hawaii is hotter than ever you know the inventory is so low and there's people the buyers have buying power so how long can it last i'm not sure you know and um inflation is can lead to uh even deflation so and that that would be horrible um uh, but I think inflation in some instances is necessary, but definitely keeping eyes on what, what's going on in the, in the economy and the housing market. The good thing about being in real estate is like the Fed will do all they can to save the housing market because the housing market is a industry that it's a, it, it's a market mover industry. You know, like it, 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 it trickles down because we touch so many different industries, you know, like, Cut, um, we employ a lot of people on our projects. There's a lot of purchasing of materials <clears throat> and those material, you know, the big box companies or whoever you're buying materials from, you know, escrow agents, realtors, stagers, photographers, you know, like there's, we touch so many industries that it's almost like the housing market. That's why in 2008, when the housing market went down, pretty much the economy, you know, felt a hit too, because we touched so many different industries. So, I think it's important to watch for, you know, what's going on with the dollar. But <clears throat> I think knowing that the Fed who controls the dollar is going to do all they can to keep interest rates low so that buyers have bu buying power, you know, specifically for housing, then, you know, I don't want people to overreact and start making moves because there's talk about inflation and, you know, maybe make the wrong move at the wrong time, you know. That's just my opinion. You know what, the, one of the things, uh, I don't know if this is selfish or not, but I kind of think as real estate investors, inflation is actually very good for us because if you have like rental properties, right? Like your mortgage payment is the same, your rent's mm -hmm. gonna go up with inflation, right? Like you bought the property whatever price, now the property is worth more just on inflation. It's not, the intrinsic value is exactly the same, but now the, the prices are going up like artificially. And then so all of our, the values of any kind of properties you own, they get boosted through inflation. So it's like a, 
it's almost like a wealth creator for like a real estate investor. As long as you have some rental properties or you're doing some kind of like flipping or whatever it is where you're holding the property yourself, you know, I mean, that's my right. thought. Yeah. And so like Daniel said, like your cost, your mortgage becomes cheaper with, with inflation. You know, that's if you have your, your assets, you know, you're holding your, I guess a, a lot of your net worth in real estate. Right. <clears throat> But I mean, hyperinflation could be really bad too. So if you can't afford to, you know, buy your milk at your grocery store, that's a problem. Yeah, it's going to be interesting no matter what. I mean, nobody has a crystal ball, but it's just good to watch the numbers and be aware of it. I think sometimes with real estate, we get into our own little bubble and we focus so much on our deals that we forget to kind of look at the context on all of that and i mean nobody really knows right deflation inflation hyperinflation uh you know and who knows if they can really hold those rates you know they said they're going to hold the rates until full employment and right now unemployment is starting to look like we're getting to full employment but then really is that the right gauge but you know we just don't know so but it's a good conversation to have so i think it's uh it's pretty interesting stuff for sure good stuff but hey, it's, uh, we should get Daniel on because uh, if anybody else wants to comment about the economy and got other insights or things that you're watching, um, just bring it on up on the chat and then we'll keep talking about it week after week. But, but Daniel, we want to bring you back on. For whoever didn't get to listen in last week, it was super exciting. And I think we went, gosh, over an hour and a half and everyone still had more questions and there was so much more because it wasn't just about Midwest investing. It was really some really cool strategies and and Daniel, I think what was inspiring is how long have you been doing, um, actually, when did you buy your first deal? How many, how many months ago? It was, the, it was like December of 2018. And so, then how many total doors have you flipped or owned at this time? Six in Indy. And then I have three that I own in Hawaii that are in, the, in like mid bar process. So basically. Yeah. That's awesome. Did you get to quit your W2 job yet? No, I'm still far away. I mean, that's, yeah, I'm still far, kind of far away from that. So I have like a five-year plan. Like I feel it's very like, realistic for that I can like achieve. But I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's awesome. a little harder than it looks to just quit your W-2. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's, that's you, you've done an amazing job. So um, just so that way, those who missed out on last week, do you have something that you can recap for us? Um, sure, I mean, the... Uh, there's kind of a lot that we kind of went over. I think that just the basic idea of just like my strategy was that um, I just really feel like really believe in like the bird process. And I think like it's uh, there's just so many levers that it gives you as an investor to kind of jumpstart your career, especially when I was first starting. I didn't have a lot of, of equity or time or, or money that I could use. And so the bird allows you to kind of get started and then not like have a lot of capital to kind of begin with. And so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but it also aligns with my end strategy of kind of generating passive income. And so I started out in Indy in 20, end of 2018, mostly in 2019. And then uh, the general idea of a bird strategy is you buy a house that needs some rehab. And so last week I kind of went over my last deal. I bought it for 52,000. Then you put a rehab into it or try to appreciate the value in some form or fashion. I think I put in like 44,000 plus a little bit of a project manager fee to be all in at a hundred. It appraised for 165 after a little bit of time. And then I was able to refinance out 75% of that, which is 123. And so, and then, and then I have a slightly either even cash flowing or slightly positive cash flowing um, asset, depending on how much you allocate for vacancy and reserves. And then hopefully the, the plan is just to keep on doing these deals over and over and at the end of the day, I don't have any of my money tied, stuck in this property. And I basically, the only constraint I have is time. So like there's capital is not a constraint for like this strategy. And like the more and more that you can, uh, I guess, acquire your portfolio, the, the closer you are to um, passive income and retiring from your W-2 if you, if you have a W-2. So that's awesome. So Daniel, just for those of us who are, you, you talk so fast and some of us are just not as bright. But uh, just so I understand it, so you spent a certain amount of money on the buying the property, then you added rehab, and then you got it appraised at this huge number, refinanced it at 70%, which was 123. Yeah. And so as a result, you refinanced it at more than what you had in it. So does that mean you actually got to take some money out of the deal? Yeah, so it was, it was actually like a really sweet deal for me because I, the, I took out cash from the deal at the end of the day and 
it's like, uh, and this cash, the beat of the cash is it's actually not a profit. It's actually a mortgage. So then like, it's, it's basically like tax free money that I get to put in my pocket. And then, uh, there's a, I have a tenant in place who's paying down my mortgage from me. And so in 30 years, I own this property free and clear. And then, uh, I mean, it's just like the equity is probably slowly building, hopefully with inflation and it boosted up a little bit more too. I mean, that, I mean, there's a lot of factors as far as how appreciation works. There's some speculation involved in there, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a powerful strategy where you pay like the minimum amount of taxes and then you're able to kind of grow your portfolio at a like more exponential rate because you're not really using, your money's not tied to the, the rental property at the end of the day. So. That's awesome. So yeah, so I think um, for everybody who's kind of new to real estate investing and you've heard about this opportunity to buy without your own money and then actually refinance and have nothing in it, it's true and Daniel is an actual, um, you know, he's sharing right now that this is something he's actually done uh, himself. And so if you've got questions, this is a, a great opportunity to ask Daniel, uh, but then also to email him on the side because it really is powerful. If you can think about it, basically what you're doing is you're buying real estate with none of your own money, you're getting money. And so basically it's free real estate, you know, bottom line. Uh, with I, tell, I tell my coworkers, like these people pay me 20 grand to, to give me a house. And they, they say like, that's, that, that's, that's like, that, that's not right. I mean, that's not right. But like, if you think about it at the end of the day, they basically pay me 20 grand to give me a, a cash flowing house. I mean, if you kind of, kind of think of like the, the whole process of it works and like the, it's a little crazy too, because um, I think I shared about it last time that I'm doing this out of state where I'm actually not walking the properties or doing anything. Everything is basically on my computer or on my phone. So it's almost like a video game. And I think somebody in the chat said last time it was like, um, Burr Sims or something <laughs> where like, it's basically you're playing this video game to kind of boost your wealth, increase, increase your, like your, your, your portfolio. And like the, the only limitation is just your creativity and like your, your network and just like your, the knowledge that you kind of like, like you have, you know, and so in time. That's funny. You're playing Sims in like real life, right? It's like Monopoly in real life. <laughs> yeah, it feels fake sometimes. I'm like, Trey, and like my goal is like to get a whole bunch of greenhouses, right? You're like yep. trying to get like all these little single families and then eventually trade it up to like either a multifamily or a DST or whatever it is, right? And so like the, yeah. that's kind of like the, the goal. Uh, what, like, can you tell us about your five-year plan? Would you mind sharing? Yeah, so I mean like the, the I mean, I kind of spoke on it real, real briefly last time was basically there's, I want to like build, a, build my net worth up. And so like in my calculators for like my, my burrs, uh, I kind of calculate how much my net worth, my net worth is going to boost after every deal. And so the net worth can be a combination of equity and also cash that I pull out. And uh, the, the thing is that the, the higher I can get my net worth, the more I can translate that at the end of the day into cash flow. And so, I mean, like you, if I can like realistically get my net worth up to like about $2 million, if I were to 1031 all that real estate net worth into a DST, then like uh, the DST is a powerful tool that you can use a 1031 exchange to basically transfer your cash flowing or uncash flowing real estate into a fund that would just pay you annually and annually. And like, I think the going rate right now is like 5%. And so if I had a 2 million net worth that I translated into a DST, I basically have a passive income of $100,000 a year with like no tenants, not, none of my involvement. It just, I'm just going to get the checks rolling in. And then of course, like do whatever you want with that or continue to invest. Or there's also like things where you can get like a lot bigger returns in multifamily where you can get maybe like 10% cash on cash or something, but it takes a little bit more um, deal finding, active involvement, et cetera. But basically my five year plan is just get my net worth up to 2 million. And then like from there, that's like my, my retirement for like my, until to do something else or continue along the path. So, so well, like buying yeah. houses for free, then that's no problem at all. I mean, it's just yeah. like you can build that thing all day long. So, and that's what's inspiring is that, you know, so much of what we do and talk about, people don't believe. So it's great to hear stories of somebody who started literally, you know, just a couple of years ago and, and you're crushing it. So it's exciting. And for those of you, those of you who don't know, uh, Daniel's the guy behind our whole CRM at Keiko Capital. And, uh, you know, he was just the, he was the quiet servant, worked super hard behind the scenes. And then deep beneath the surface was this aggressive investor that is innovative, creative, risk taker. And so uh, super, super exciting. Uh, so on that line, Daniel, can you kind of walk us back through if, and I think somebody even asked a similar question, is if we're going to work in a, another state such as, uh, you know, 
Where are you at now? You're in Midwest. Indianapolis, yeah. Just that one city, or are you in any other cities? Just in one, that's the one city. And there's a lot of strategies. I think some people say you want to um, you want to um, expand your portfolio to limit your risk, et cetera. But for me, my conclusion came to is that the team on the ground and the, the trust you build there is so much more important than kind of like, um, separate, I mean, um, putting yourself in different markets. And so like the, I kind of build like a little bit of uh, some trust and some team members and things for on Indianapolis specifically where I know the market really well. I spent a lot of time researching like the, the, the areas, the streets, the, the project managers, all the players. There's like... Uh, like in Hawaii, there's like everybody, all the serious players kind of know each other. Then like the same way in Indy where there's like a pocket of people who are like serious investors, serious project managers, serious wholesalers, et cetera, that kind of like, you know, the cream kind of rises to the top. Yeah. And so you know who to work with, who is like a little more trustworthy, et cetera. And so just kind of like focusing all my time and energy into that market, I was able to kind of build some relationships, also build trust and just kind of like get like a insight, um, insider knowledge to like the, the different neighborhoods or different kinds of parts of how things work as far as like just like the my time and energy there's still like focus my time and energy over there so that's why i kind of just chose just to stay within the indie marketplace so market. daniel what would you recommend to somebody who's you know so you just started you know not too long ago mm -hmm. uh and so if you were to say somebody always asks the question should i start in my local market or should i go to a market like indy kansas city ohio uh tennessee and invest at a distance, you know, so very different types of strategies. What's your recommendation having done both? I think it really depends on what your current situation is as far as experience, um, in capital, in network, and also what your end goals are. And so when I first started, like, I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about real estate. I didn't have a lot of money. And so, like, Hawaii was, I honestly thought it was, like, impossible because the price ranges of, like, medium single family at 800,000. I'm like, I had like 50 grand in my bank account. It was like impossible, you know? And so when I looked across the, the pond to like Indianapolis, you can buy houses for 10 grand. I mean, like if you really want to, you know? And so it's just a different kind of like risk factor and also kind of like um, end goal strategy. And in Hawaii, houses don't cash flow. My end goal was to get cash flow for like to initially to replace my W2. And so like in Indianapolis, there's like, a lot of houses you, you'll easily find cash flow as far as when you buy um buy rental property and so like and then the mistakes are like less right so in hawaii you do a rehab for like 150 grand you can easily balloon to like 200 grand you know and so in indy you do a rehab for like 30 grand if things go terrible you're at 40 grand you know i mean like it's a uh, the the risk factor is like a little bit less and let's say like the your contractor walks up with all your money like boom you're out of like 30 grand i mean like that sucks terribly but at the same time it's it's not like you're out like 150 grand, you know I mean? It's just like a different kinds of like level that you're kind of playing with. And so depending yeah. on how much cash reserves you have, depending on what your goals are, I think that that would kind of determine where you want to put your time and energy and where you kind of want to start out. But for me, starting out in a lower price point, cash flowing area, that like, it's just like less risk and more aligned with kind of like my long-term goals. So. Yeah, that's good. Corey and I are laughing because we've had a contractor walk out with six figures and it's painful. It is so painful. And so uh, we become alcoholics after that, but that's all right. We're recovering and we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> but that's a super mortgage payments are become low cheaper. Like, you know, like if, if the project runs long, you know, paying a paying high interest on a $30,000 loan is not the same as paying high interest on a $300,000 loan, you know? So, yeah. So Daniel, on that regard, there's a bunch of questions as well. So I'm kind of asking a version of different questions. So if I'm kind of new, let's say, say and there's a whole bunch of us listening and some of us are new or like, hey, you know, um, maybe we'll think about indie. So obviously your team on the ground is really important. You talked about the contractor and obviously you don't want anybody walking out on you, even if it's 30,000 bucks. How did you vet out a contractor and a broker in the city that you trust? Because you said now you don't even go, and at first you did. So uh, let's start with kind of how did you vet out your team, uh, and then we can kind of branch from there. Sure, so I mean like the first, the, the first way I just kind of got started was just like networking on bigger pockets and Google Yelp, you know? And so like, uh, it's actually like a lot of work. I mean, you gotta make a lot of phone calls, you gotta like sprout, read a lot of like Facebook groups, and like, I mean, send messages to people back and forth, and then like, uh, so for when it comes to a broker or wholesaler, like I honestly don't care what their reputation is or whatever. I just look at the deal itself. And so there's a lot of like wholesalers who will like, will do like a really crazy ARVs that don't make sense or rent prices that don't make sense. But honestly, the first thing I do when I get a deal is like, I just threw out the, the pro forma that the wholesaler gives me because 
Like you don't even want to look at that. You just want to look, you analyze the deal yourself. So as far as like realtor, real estate agents or brokers for me, like most of my deals are all wholesalers. And so like, I just look at the deal itself when it comes to the wholesalers. But I think the important part is like your, your contractor is like a, one of the hardest parts for an outside investor to kind of make sure that they're doing a good job, et cetera. Like they're, they're, they're actually working that they're like performing. So for me, my first, my first bird that I did, I, I called a bunch of different contractors, like asked them to walk the property, et cetera. And then interviewed a few people. And then I found somebody that I liked, but at the, in the beginning he was like, awesome. You know, like he was like, yeah, I'll check in and every Friday show you pictures and like have like this CRM that you can like look at, et cetera and stuff. And then after like the first week, he just kind of like, like was like really slow. He didn't upload pictures. I kind of had to like talk to him and stuff. And like, he was like, it was just like a different person, you know, versus like when the first person I, when I first interviewed him. And so yeah. like, I wasn't sure what's going on and stuff. I mean, like he seemed like a nice guy, you know, but at the same time it was like, it was very different than the, the, the initial interview of what I was trying to, um, when I talked to him, you know? And so I talked to different wholesalers or different investors in the area and um, somebody recommended me this project manager. And so this project manager, what he does is he becomes your boots on the ground and you pay him like 10% over the, the GC cost. And so like the GC cost is like three, 30 grand. You pay this um, project manager three grand just to manage your project. And so it's kind of like cool because like it's it like all of our um, interests align where the project manager is making really good money just to make sure that things are moving. So he's not actually picking up a hammer or anything. He just visiting your project a few times a week and just making sure that like he's your eyes on the ground right? because the, the contractor is not going to take a picture of like his shoddy work or tell you when he doesn't show up to the job, et cetera. But my project manager is the guy who's kind of like keeping tabs on things and making things sure things are happening. And for his time, he's like well compensated honestly at three grand a month for like a two month project, you know? And so, uh, and he actually works with like a lot of out of state investors and there's a lot of like um, dumb money, they call it from like the coasts, like um, California or Hawaii, where the prices in India are like so ridiculous that we think, oh, it's 50,000, like what's 50,000, just buy a house, whatever. And so like the, but then we don't have like the boots in the ground to kind of like help us manage this project. And so my project manager is kind of like my, my he's like my ace in the hole in, in the Indianapolis market to like manage my, my, my contractors and then like um, kind of make sure things happen. So when I need to hook up like the utilities after I buy the project, he'll meet the, um, the the inspection company comes when they come there. When the, I get my appraisal, he like talks up the appraiser, you know, like there's a lot of small things that he does on the side in addition. And then like my simply safe. So like, um, I want to put an alarm in the, in the property while it's vacant or wants to be renovated because in case it gets like burglarized. Right? So he's a, uh, I, I bought a simply safe system, which by the way, is awesome. Had him install it. He's in charge of that. So he does like a lot of the little things that I would ask like the boots in the ground for me to, to kind of handle. So. Well, he's a key player for sure on the powder team. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who would you say is the key players on your team that you have to build to get to get out there? Cause it's so interesting about, you know, you doing this, you haven't even seen some of these houses, right? Yeah. So yeah, when I, my first two, I did like sight unseen. I took a trip after I bought the first two, I looked at them. And then since then I bought four more and like, yeah, I haven't been to Indy since. But then I think the biggest thing is like, so I know like there's another investor, he invests in Kansas City, this guy CJ. He's an awesome bird investor, but he just is really good at um, connecting with, he has a good relationship with his general contractor. And I know they went through like, honestly, like 10 plus general contractors over the, over the years. And so there's definitely like a learning like uh, a curve, but the biggest thing is like, he has a really good relationship and trust factor with the general contractor to be able to do the bids at a reasonable rate and to make sure that the, the project is kind of going along. And so, for me, like my ace in the hole has been my project manager, you know, as far as like making sure like he's the one that does everything and that makes basically makes the things happen. I just have to add a little bit of more um, um, his fee into like the, my pro forma in order to make sure that it's, it's happening. And then as far as property management, so there's kind of like two kind of schools of thought as far as like finding deals is if you go in the big city, there's a lot more um, competition because there's a lot of investment activity, there's a lot of things that's going on. If you go to little small suburbs, like a little outside the city, you can find better deals because there's like less competition and there's like little different like kind of niches. But then the thing is like your pool of renters and your pool of like um, contractors slash property management shrinks when you go outside. And so one of the choices I consciously made was like, okay, like I saw like tons of great deals like right outside the city. But then when I talked to my project manager, he's like, yeah, I don't want to drive to like the, to that place that's too far, like wasting my time, et cetera. And so I kind of make a decision to kind of stick to the general indie market where it's a little bit more, 
competition as far as other investments, but your pool of contractors and property managers are like a lot more abundant. And so like the property manager, once your, your assets stabilize, is like a very, very big part of your team to where like if they don't do a good job screening your tenants or they don't do a good job managing your, your property, that's like a huge hole that you can have like in your, in your, in your book. So I'd say like your property manager and then your project, your GC slash project manager are like the two like main guys as far as like your, your team's involved. So I think what's good is that, um, you know, if I were to reiterate kind of what you said, because you, uh, you have so much good stuff is if anybody's considering a new market before going to that market to actually uh, start investing is get involved, network, you know, and you can network from wherever you're at, Hawaii or wherever you're at in the country, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, and, and just start getting on the, like Daniel said, the Facebook pages, all of the social media, um, up in Washington, we have a thing called WARI, Washington Real Estate Investors. Uh, there's the same in Vegas. And so just start networking and you'll start seeing, like Daniel said, the cream of the crop rise and then kind of watch uh, who people are talking about. And once you start building relationships, that's when you can ask who's there, who's everybody using for general contractors, who's everyone using for uh, project managers. And that's a good way to start is, is just really start understanding the network of resources first. And then, like Daniel said, travel to the city and drive every street. I, I really love that you did that. Like you drove every street, you sat at every corner and you kind of sniffed the roses or I don't know what you get in Indy, sniff the cactuses. Um, so whatever you sniffed, you sniffed them. And then you uh, kind of went around and kind of understood the area. So I think that that's super good. And then you slowly kind of built that team and now you've got a really good power team. Uh, and that's, that's pretty exciting overall. Uh, so for your mortgages, do you get mortgages for your properties with hard money? And do you use that or do you use a local bank for some of your uh, properties when you do the takeout? So you're talking about the initial purchase and rehab or the after the 30 year loan after? Yeah. So for somebody who's like brand new, like right now they're listening and they're like, oh, I like buy something at 10,000. I was in Michigan. My wife's from Michigan. It's the Hicks. I mean, there's not even a Starbucks. But um, I was looking at, you can buy houses for 4,000 bucks, bro. For less than we spend on, less than Corey spends on coffee and monsters a year, you could buy a full on house. And it's crazy, right? But, but the reality is you can't get hard money and you can't get financing for some of that. Um, but if you're brand new and you're looking at trying to get into a market like this, how did you do it? Like who's your, what did you do for financing on the initial? And then how did you do your rehab budget? And then how did you do your takeout? So for me, like the, one of the beauties of the indie market is things are just so cheap, you know? And so when I first got started, like I, I just kind of try to amass as much personal money or access to money that I could get. And so I had um, like a little bit of cash in the bank. I took a loan against my 401k and then I just signed up for a whole lot of personal unsecured lines of credit. And so that come the combination of those two kind of gave me enough money to kind of get started and to play inside the indie market. And so there's kind of like some tricks and two things for like, how to play with like, and so like when you're to, I mean, to how to take out as much money as possible. There's private lenders, your 401k, there's a, I mean, like personal unsecured lines of credit, which I highly recommend. And then whatever kinds of um, other sources of finances you can get to kind of, kind of get your pool to get started. And so from there, once I kind of got started doing like the, the burrs, then the tricky part of that after that, what I found was difficult is that um, you got to refinance that into a 30 year loan. And so when you refinance it to a 30 year loan, I think I went over some of the, tips some tricks last last call about how to kind of like navigate that particular step in the bird process and so there's kind of like three things you need in a in your from a personal or financial standpoint to do the 30-year finances your dti debt to income ratio i think the average is it has to be like basically it's a it's a relationship between how much is your new mortgage plus all your existing debts is divided by your gross income and so that's the average of that is usually has to be like around 45 percent and then there's different kind of hacks you can do to either lower your debt or increase your income to kind of get your percentages better. And then the second thing is like, you need to have a, a decent credit score. And so like there, it varies on the ranges, what kind of scores you need, depending on um, your bank and depending on like the, what kind of terms you're trying to qualify for. And there's also like hacks on how to get your credit score up too. I mean, there's, um, there's things like, so I think one of the things people don't realize is that when you, your, your credit score is like a moving target. So there's like things you can do to kind of like instantly boost your, your credit score. And so like things like, um, like your credit card, when you have like a, your credit card statement, there's a different date where the credit card statement is generated versus when they actually report to the credit agency. 
So it's not necessarily the same date. So you want your, the date that they report your balance to the, the credit agencies to be really low to lower your, your debt to income ratio versus your, your credit statement. So even if you pay off your credit card balance every month, it's whatever date they snapshot your, your, your debt at the time they report to the credit agency, it gets reported on your credit report. So you kind of want to like sign up for a free site like Credit Karma or whatever.com and see what dates are the, the credit card agency and your lines of credit are actually reporting to the credit agency and make sure your, your number at that date is really low just to lower like your debt to income ratio. And then like the, there's like, and there's also some other creative things you can do is like in your credit score is, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of things called like trade lines before, but basically you can like borrow other people's credit where like, so there's this thing called like a, um, like an authorized, authorized user where if you have a friend or family member who has great credit, you can sign up to be an authorized user on their credit card or their um, whatever line of credit. And then you basically like can borrow their credit score to addition to add to your credit score. And then there's actually these things called trade lines where you can buy people's credit score or rent their credit score from them too. And so like, there's like, there's some like things where like the, it's like a, I mean, you can do more research on it basically, but I've never done that before because I never really had to, but there's like a lot of like small hacks you can do in your credit score to kind of boost your credit score up higher. And so you want your DTI higher, your credit score higher and then your cash reserves. And so last week I talked a little bit, some facts about how to get your cash reserves higher to qualify for, for, the, for the, the financing. But I mean, there's, and there's a lot of like things, small things here and there where you can do to kind of like, I guess there's kind of three separate entities that are like a little bit connected to each other, but at the same time, it's basically like, you need to get those three things on like ready in order to refinance like the, the property at the end of the, at the, end of the, the process. Uh, repeat the three things, please. So it's your debt to income ratio, your DTI, on average, it has to be a 45% to qualify after you add your new mortgage on top of it. It's your credit score, which is like whatever, I mean, your, your current credit score at the snapshot when they take your look, when you apply for the loan. And so you want to do some pre-planning ahead of that time to get your, your snapshot like looking good. And then there's your cash reserves. And so the cash reserves are going to be like, um, like six to 12 months of the more new mortgage payments plus your closing costs plus any kind of reserves that you need on other properties that you hold that you have that are show up on your credit report. So those are the three things you need to kind of get your ducks in a row. And a little pre-planning ahead of time can kind of help you to make yourself look good to like a, a conventional lender to, to qualify for these things. And this is only applies to conventional loans. Once they get to the commercial or asset-based loans, it's slightly different. So there's, there's things you can do on that end too, but I mean, it's a, that's kind of like a, a little bit different topic. I've, I've never heard of that trade lines. For, for credit, like, so what, ha what is the penalty for, not penalty, but what is the person who's offering their credit to lend their credit, um, what is the downside for them? So then like, you're basically, like when you do a trade line, like, so let's say your, your family member says like, you say, yeah, kind of like bad credit, you're like, hey, can I borrow your, your credit? It's like, basically, like my, my dad say, hey dad, like my credit's like 400, like you got an 800 credit score, can I borrow your credit? He's like, okay, I've got these credit cards. I'll add you as an authorized user on these credit cards. Oh. So now these credit cards show up in my, my, um, in my credit report. And then I get his length of history of his credit, of his credit card. I get to have his history of payments, et cetera, kind of basically added to like my, my credit report. And then the reason why this happened was because like back in the day when like the spouses, like the, they were trying to qualify whatever. And then like the husband was the one doing and working like the, whatever government agency says like, hey, it's not fair that the spouses are working at home and they're not getting to like leverage the credit. So then the credit, the, they made some kind of rule where the spouses have to be allowed to leverage the husband's credit. But then people were just taking advantage of it and saying like, okay, now it's just, there's no distinction. I mean, there's long story short is that there's, these, there's ways where you can kind of borrow people's credit to kind of boost your credit score. And uh, there's a whole like little like thing on it where you, and so now there's a, a little economy where you can sell your credit, but then like, let's say that my dad gives me access to his credit and I just start buying a whole bunch of crap or like whatever, right? So like, I'm kind of screening him over like at the same time. So there's some trust factor involved with that as far as like him letting me borrow his credit. So that might be the downside to my dad. Like if he doesn't trust me, he's like, heck no, I'm not letting you, like adding you as an author user on my, on my credit card. <laughs> no, seriously, Charlie, uh, we're going to pick on you because you posted it. You seriously got a friend who sells out your credit line and you get cash flow from it. Tell us how that works really quick. That's awesome. That seems um, fascinating and risky at the same time. So what if somebody like goes and buys a Lamborghini, like just back up your credit? 
No. So how does this work? No. Well, now if I now if I screwed up on the credit that I was lending, it would affect the person that's applying for the credit. Now them being allowed to use my authorized user line doesn't affect them at all unless I screw up somewhere. So, so tell us how it works. Let's say uh, Corey, like borrow your credit score. Uh, yeah. Like how does that work? So you just go, okay, so you they, box or how well, does that so the way that my buddy does it is, is he actually, um, he brokers the, he brokers the lines out to people. So if you have less than perfect credit, what he's doing is he's taking my credit, like my $15,000 chase card, and he's brokering that to someone with less than perfect credit. So they essentially get to piggyback off of my great credit. Um, as long as my credit is, is in good standing and, and you know, like that, that kind of 30% rule on the, on the, on the credit usage is, is low, then that person gets to ride that um, or use, I guess the, the uh, that kind of credit algorithm that as long as below 30%, that person gets to benefit off me having great credit. Uh, so that's basically how it works. Like he'll sell my, you know, he'll go and sell the line for, I don't know, a thousand bucks and they get to use that line for about 90 days. And so after the 90 days, it, it's removed. So well, they pay a thousand bucks. No, that's what he's selling it for. He's selling it for a thousand dollars for 90 days. And then he's, he, I guess he's taking his piece and then he'll, he'll give me a little bit. It, it, it doesn't bother me any because uh, again, it doesn't affect like them, them piggybacking off of my great, you know, that great credit history and the great credit age doesn't affect me any at all. So basically if what happens is, is he'll run them through an application process and then um, they'll give the social, their, their personal information and then my buddy will then add them to, you know, my, you know, add them to that line that they're looking to use. So they don't have access to your chase card per se. No, they don't get anything sent to them. Yeah. They just got to do that. They just get to use, they just get to use the line. So it's, okay, it's but just but from what he, to, to what, what he's explained to me is um, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily the line. It's the age of the, of the credit. So if someone has great payment history and they've had it since like the eighties, you know, then and 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 there's someone that has less than perfect credit that's looking to say boost their credit score, say a hundred points. Um, that'd be a, a a very easy way to boost your your score in in a, in a matter of thirty to forty five days. Yeah, super good. Um, yeah. Stacy like uh, lend out her credit score, so if anybody <laughs> like pay her a thousand bucks, she's, she's yeah. ready to roll. Kakoa. We also have through Keiko Capital a credit repair person we work with. It's like $150. So if anyone's interested in that, we can definitely work with you yeah. and let us know. Yeah. They do. He's phenomenal. He'll turn around your credit within 30 or 60 days. Yeah, that's awesome. Scott, you're driving. So Justin, will you drop Scott's number in there, our email address in case you're needing a credit repair person? And then Charlie, can you uh, respond to Stacy because she like sell her soul i mean her credit score <laughs> and, then, um, and then but while we're on the topic this is really good because like we just had mike i just checked my credit and we have no debt like we don't own anything on cars no credit cards um but then we took a hit because we weren't watching our credit so just something to keep in mind especially with as investors we're always leveraging hard money and different lines and and leveraging cards sometimes for rehab is try pull your credit from time to time or have a credit monitoring uh, and just watch because sometimes especially right now there's people jacking other people's um, credit lines and credit cards and applying under different names so uh, just watch for that because inevitably you need your credit when you want to buy something and you don't realize it's jacked up until you apply for credit and then all of a sudden they're just like we you know you've got a low credit score and you're like that can't be right you know, um, there's, there's some, like, that's a really good point, Kiko, and there's, like, free sites you can go to. I think, like, Credit Karma is, like, one of the most famous ones, and it gives you, like, every week it repulls your software and your credit, or your credit report so you can see. I think WalletHub does it daily. So, basically, you can see, like, uh, what your credit report is, like, at all, all times. And that's also how I researched when the reporting dates were happening as far as, like, when is the credit card company and when is the lines reporting to the credit agencies because it tells you the date that they reported to like the and that's when you got that's how you can play with the, your balances and stuff so if you have a line of credit that you know is going to be reporting soon to like the, the credit agency pay off that line and then like let us 
reports to the currency and then take it out again or, or whatever. I mean, that's how you can kind of like play or move money around as far as like just showing like a lower like debt to income ratio too. And so that's awesome. And Elijah brought up a good point. Check out your kids' credit scores because you never know if somebody's, uh, if maybe Charlie's friend is using their credit without nobody knowing. <laughs> what I do too is, um, I don't know, this probably is obvious if everybody else does this, but anytime that I pull my credit, uh, you know, apply for a loan, like I just did a refi, and when they do the hard pull, I ask them for a copy of my report because, I, and I use, I check credit karma every week too, but what's on the actual report, a lot of times doesn't exactly match credit karma. You know, credit karma is close, but not perfect. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Greg. How come you not let, how come you don't let us uh, see your white Porsche today? <laughs> yeah. All right, there you go. <laughs> there we go. Car. Always in this car, Ra. Always. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right that's all good hey charlie yeah, thanks man. thanks for that insightful uh tangent i've never that's heard crazy. of that charlie yeah. you're in vegas yeah charlie are you in vegas we're in dallas you're in dallas that's right uh we're gonna be uh cory and i will be down in austin in a couple weeks so if you uh if you want to come over we'll go grab lunch how far is dallas from austin pretty far probably huh? super far <laughs> <laughs> it's a couple hours Oh, is that all? Not too bad. Yeah. Ah, come on out. Right oh, on. depending on how fast you drive, you can go ninety and get there in like less than two. Oh, nice. <laughs> or if we've got, or if we got Greg's car, will be less than twenty minutes. <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. That was a great. That was. Well, yeah, that was a great tip. Thanks, Charlie and, and Daniel, for that. I'm gonna look more into that. I want to make thousand dollars lending out my credit. That'll be fun. <laughs> Yeah, but bro, you got to get good credit first. That's why. <laughs> Excellent credit. <laughs> 500 credit scores, Corey, so I'm sorry. Excellent credit, but banks still don't like me. The conventional banks, you know. Oh, they're like, you got how much debt? <laughs> yeah, they're like, how many properties do you own? That's always the hardest part when we always buy another house. And well, Corey's just uh, doing some refinancing in Hawaii right now, so they're having us fill this thing and you have to always do your, your list of all your real estate owned. And there's just not enough lines on the paper, bro. <laughs> I only gave them, I gave, I gave it them to 2018, our deals that we've done to 2018. And that was it. I said, do you need any more? Cause like, honestly, I can update this, but it's going to take me like four days, you know? So luckily we didn't have to, but yeah, it's pretty really easy, but it's a good um, thing. Real um, quick, I wanted to open it up to uh, Q and A for everybody. Um, but before we do that, Daniel, I know you had additional tips, but did you have any more that you wanted to discuss? Because that was I mean, great. Yeah, one, one more, one, also just one more thing, but I mean, uh, I just wanted to shout out to say like, it's a, uh, this community is like excellent. I mean, thank you for, I mean, I got that tip from this other guy, this other investor. And then like, I talked to uh, Mike Hasegawa, if you're on, thanks for letting me just bring that back up again. And then Jonah Wilson, he also like mentioned, and uh, I've heard this before, that you can also take a business line of credit. I think there's something like if you, as long as you own an LLC for like two years, I'm not sure if you, I think you might be able to, when I talked to another guy, it was like, you had kind of zero income and you can apply for like a, a business line of credit here locally. And some banks will give you like 50 grand to like, to play with. And so like, that's another kind of like avenue that you can kind of like plan ahead and then try and get like a business line of credit. And then just like one real quick thing I was going to share is like the, the, you want to, when you're doing the refinance on your property, there's a, first you got to qualify for the loan, like personally, but then you also, your appraisal is like super important on your property. And so this is one of the things I think I see where investors kind of get like, like hung up or like they make mistakes or like you calculate your ARV wrong or even when you get your AR, your appraisal report, then like you don't know how to rebut it or you don't know how to look best in terms of like the, for the bank, you know? And so when I, short story, when the, my first bar I did, like um, I expected my appraisal to come back about one, one around 130, 135, it came back at 70 grand. And then I was like, oh man, like this is terrible. And so I was like, that. I put it. And then I found out that you can actually rebut your appraisal. And so like, um, when I looked at the comps, it was like one that comes to it was like, my whole neighborhood is a bunch of flipping houses that being flipped. So then like, uh, they, they're all like, the comps they're using were like houses that were bought really cheap. And then they're like, one house that it was like, it was purchased for like 50 grand, but then it was on the market now for 150, you know? So like, the, it's obviously the, the value of the house is actually there. And so like, I put together a little packet for the, the appraiser and then after the the uh, appraiser reviewed it like miracle of miracles they reappraise it at 140. so i mean it's a huge difference as far as just like and that honestly was a miracle but i mean like the whenever you get like bad bad appraisals you can like 
um, you either rebust your appraisal or if you don't like it, you can order a second appraisal from another appraiser until you like basically like your appraisal. But I mean, you have to be within reason. I mean, you need three solid comps that you're actually trying to use. You know, it's kind of be like a, a fly and all kind of thing. But I actually put together like a appraisal packet for my um, appraiser that kind of like walks through like the rehabs that we did. And then it shows like good pictures of like the property after it's just re refinanced because once the tenants move in, you don't know if they have their junk or whatever kind of stuff and how it's going to look. And then like a little bit of short thing on the, on like the, the area and stuff too. And so like, I think that's like a little small tip you can do as far as just making sure you present your, your property to get appraised for like you know, the highest kind of like value, you know? So I just like, that's my other like last little short tip. So. Yeah. Appraisals are, are like, it's key for the birth strategy, but also like when you're selling, when you're flipping houses too. Right. But the fact that he was off by that much yeah is that, yeah I, I honestly thought there was like no way i was like maybe he'll rise it to like 100 but like there's no way i'm gonna get close to the the one the, the number i was gonna get but honestly i like like kudos to him man for making that correction so i like it worked out yeah. So. right yeah well let's, uh, Corey, let's try hit some of the uh questions in the chat and then okay. Um, it'd be cool since we're kind of talking about out of state investing, if maybe like Charlie or somebody on a future one can talk about the other market because Charlie locked up some, and then I think Elijah's doing some, uh, pretty interesting, fascinating topic for sure. Right. I'm always interested to hear like what, uh, markets that people are investing in and why, you know, why? Yeah. Cause it's going to be interesting. I think the, I think in the times that we're in now, a lot's going to shift, you know, like we're already seeing it in New York. The question is, are people going to come back to New York, right? Mm -hmm. I'm betting on New York, you know, it's, I'm betting that it's going to come back, but how long is it going to take? But same, but other markets like the Bay Area or Silicon Valley side, um, I'm wondering if it's going to come back, if that market will ever come back because it's, it's tech heavy, right? And most of these tech companies can work from home. They used to give, they were paying people to basically work from home, if that makes sense. Because when these companies bring on employees, right? Like there's a, there's a whole package that they, they're investing into that, that new employee, which includes housing sometimes and, and move costs for moving stuff like that. So they're actually paying people to, to work from home, to not, you know, move to, the office in the Bay area or something. So I'm wondering if that market's going to come back. So I'm thinking everything might shift, but that's why I'm, I'm really interested to hear everybody in different markets. And I want to know the reason why. For buy and holds, I would honestly look in San Antonio. Um, if anyone's in the market for San Antonio, my auntie, she's a real estate agent and a property manager. So there's someone there you can trust, uh, watch after your property and everything. So yeah, as far as buying holes, pretty much most parts of Texas. Nice. San Antonio, huh? How far is that from Austin? About three and a half. Oh, bro, you're driving by yourself. We ain't going that far. <laughs> oh, growing up, we used to drive from San Antonio to Georgia. That was 18 hours. Holy smokes. Why would you do that? <laughs> well, let's, um, Corey, just real, let's see. There was one question somebody had asked about um, the contractor that you and I had. I would just say, if you're going to use a contractor, always write it down and always have everything in writing. And always have a real clear delineation of how you're going to do draw requests and communicate as to what happens if things don't go well. Um, I kind of have a new saying that I've been saying a lot lately uh, with a lot of our team members, and that is because we're friends, we're going to write everything down and have it all in writing. Uh, so what happens is that as you get more experience in flipping homes or investing is we, I don't think the word's lazy, but we, we have a sense of trust that sometimes needs articulation to ensure that we're still always in sync. So trust has to align with communication. So that way the trust continues to be growing at the right direction, which is positive. Because sometimes, you know, it just relationships happen over time and you just be like, oh yeah, you know, just like the last deal you sent, like um, Daniel said, you sent pictures and you reported it on Friday and that was awesome. So on this project, I assumed you were gonna do the same thing. And then when that didn't happen, now I'm disappointed, now I'm frustrated. And then pretty soon it snowballs and then things just get sour. 
And so I would just say anytime you're interviewing a contractor and any, whether it's your first flip or a couple hundred flips in, always use a nice template and uh, get an attorney to always take a look at it. So that way the escape clauses, you know, if you got to let the contractor go, go, what does that look like? You know, how, what, what percentage of your deposit do you get back? So everything's written, everything's signed. So in case you have to go to small claims court, it's all really well put together. Uh, and that would help. I think Corey and I, we have just, uh, we just really trust uh, right up, right up front. And, and sometimes uh, we're, we're much more handshake type people, you know, that's kind of local style is, you know, you do what you say. And, and sometimes that works. And sometimes it doesn't. And everybody's intentions are always positive. Uh, but sometimes things happen and situations happen that are beyond our control on, on uh, you know, like a subs team or some situation happens on a contractor's team. And then that impacts you as the investor. So that would be what I would say is to prevent it, write it down, have contracts, have your attorney review it, make sure you follow the contract. And when there's a change in work order, write it down. Uh, you know, Corey and I, sometimes we got so comfortable, we just walk a, a project and we're like, hey, so you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do that, yeah? Yep. All right. Good. And we leave. And then a week later we come back and like nothing got done. And we're like, what happened? And they're all, well, you know, we got this and that. And, and so just, if you write it all down, there's a lot less um, guesswork and a lot less disappointment. Would you add anything that to that, bro? Um, yeah, no, that, that you said it, you know, everything that needs to be said really on that. Um, and then sometimes too, it's like, you're gonna, you may run across a, uh, a contractor who just runs off with your money you can have all the paperwork tight um and you know they people will still do that and then you have the question of if you want to go chase that money chase after it for us it was a big dollar and uh but it wasn't it still wasn't worth it to go you know after that money because we weren't the only you know investors there's another, another two other developers that you know they, they lost way more than us so you can have you know all the paperwork tight too but just like that's what you want to do but if somebody's going to run off with your money they're going to run off with your money <laughs> and it's whether or not you're going to go after them right so um sometimes that happens you know you gotta trust the people that you work with and we did we had we, we had years of you know working with this crew um and then they had a shake up in the company and took a turn took a turn for the worse for us but you know we uh Fortunately, you know, we're healthy enough that we can get, you know, get something like that. Will's question is really good. Um, is like, whose paperwork do you use, yours or the contractors? Uh, from our experience, we like to use ours because our attorney prepared it on our behalf. So it represents our interests. That's not to say we couldn't use somebody else's from time to time that happens. And so then, of course, you want your attorney to take a look at it. And it just sounds expensive every time you get um, an attorney involved. But I think we've discovered is once you build a good relationship with an attorney, it's the first period of time when you got to get everything set up that seems expensive is everything's brand new, new forms and such. But the attorney we're using for our property management company, like she's basically on retainer because we have so many clients. And what's nice is that because we have a great relationship with her, uh, it's fast. Like she just, she can respond quick and then she just does a minor edit. So now it's, it's an ongoing uh, growth process as opposed to a development. And so I'd say find a good attorney, um, like the one that was posted earlier, and build a good relationship. And that way, it's really easy to edit and modify as you need. Um, and you don't realize you need paperwork and a good attorney until you need paperwork and a good attorney. So it's good to just anticipate that you're going to need them at some time. Yeah, that was a great question. Will Wall. Hey, Will, where are you from, Will? Hey, I'm from uh, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, California out here. Hey, there you are, Will. Nice. How's LA right now? Man, can't complain. Nice 80 degree weather. It's, it's nice out here. Sweet. Are you an investor, flipper, wholesaler, DJ? <laughs> DJ, no. I, so I, my full time, my W-2 job, is, as Daniel likes to call it, is I, I work for the LA Chargers on the new NFL stadium they're building out here. Oh, um, so I work oh, for the, uh, the Chargers football team, but on the side with my side money, um, I do, I'm, I'm starting to do some flips and, and stuff up here in Los Angeles. So uh, just, just starting to get started up here and, and getting the, uh, getting the process built out. That's awesome. So you're building a big stadium for nobody to sit in. 
It, it's it's pretty wild, right? <laughs> that's that's kind of crazy, but uh, yeah, I mean, eventually, hopefully, that changes, right? Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm working on the project for three years. I've seen the area around town just absolutely blow up, and and Inglewood is, you know, you could have bought a home there for two hundred thousand a couple of years ago that's selling for seven or eight hundred thousand now. And you know, when you see those types of numbers, it's like, man, I'm in the wrong business here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, Alex is asking you a question that I was just going to ask. We have um, some good opportunities down in LA. Do you buy off market? Do you wholesale at all? Or do you know any deals down there? Uh, yes, I, I do buy off market homes. So I, I work with some investors down in San Diego and, and up here in LA. And yeah, we, we are looking to buy homes currently. Sweet. We've got a like a yeah, I'll put my email in there and uh, you can get in touch. That's good. Uh, residential and commercial? Uh, mostly single family homes right now. I'll go up to like a duplex or, you know, three or four plex, but I haven't, um, you know, bridged over into the bigger units yet. Sweet. We've got a really nice house in Beverly Hills if uh, that's off market, if you're interested. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, send, send me over the email. I was looking at a, a $1.2 million home down in Point Loma, San Diego yesterday and uh, almost pulled the trigger. So, you know, if it makes dollars, it makes sense. We'll take a look at it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it should. Alex, what's our numbers on the Beverly Hills one? 7 million acquisition, 12 million ARV? Yeah. You single family. Yeah, right? it's a little over 7 million. It's like 7.5 to 8 million uh, for the acquisition with the $12 million ARV. It's on Sunset coming down from Brentwood. We'll, we'll, I can send you, you. we'll send you the information on that. You find a buyer for it, we'll, uh, we'll get you a whole lot of gift cards. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, Stacy's got someone too. She's asking to send it to her. her uh, check the chat, Alex. Sweet. It's, a, anybody, really, it's a really it's nice house. For, uh, um, Daniel, I had one. I, I it just slipped my mind. I'd like to know other markets that people are are um, doing the birth strategy out in, because. Uh, so Indian, I heard Indianapolis, Kansas City, actually no, a few people investing in Kansas City and Hawaii. Jin is in Kansas City. And then, Troy, did you guys ever pull the trigger on Ohio? Oh, I heard about Ohio too. Yeah. I think I Alabama, I heard a lot about, more for multifamily though. Yeah. That's cool. St. Louis. Oh, that's Charlie. Charlie and his cheap houses. <laughs> that's a deal. 5,000 bucks. Where's Fountain Square? Is that Kansas City? Is that, or is that Indy? That's Indy. That's Indy? Kind of want to go to Indy and check it out. I've never thought about it. Uh, they had the show, um, the, the two, two Chicks and a Hammer. I forgot what it's called. The, um, the, <laughs> You flip houses in Fountain Square. Uh, good bones. Yeah, yeah, good bones. Good bones. Oh, that uh, one. That's so funny. What did you call them? Two chicks and a hammer? That's what their company is called. It's like two chicks and a hammer. For real? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> did, did we have a story with those good bones people? People? Uh, no, they were just, when HGTV approached us, I think they were also looking at Good Bones, or the, that couple, the two chicks. We were going to be the other two chicks with no hammers. <laughs> the two chicks. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't pretty enough. We weren't two pretty guys enough. We weren't bone. bone. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. Well, man, so Columbus, Ohio... I got to, we got to start nailing down these markets. I want to play ball in that space. You know what too though? Like the thing is, it's, if you, everyone's saying like Florida and Texas because of the, the appreciation factor. And so I guess like the, there's a demographic consensus where people are moving from the coastal cities and then from the North where it's cold down to the South where it's a little warmer. And you got a lot of baby boomers who are like, Hey, I'm going to retire. I don't want to retire when it's cold. I want to retire where it's warm. And so like a general like trend of, trend of like people moving down, especially to like the landlord, not landlord, but the more red states, I think is like more attractive for like less taxes, right? So Florida and Texas, you don't have like taxes or as much taxes. And so the, as far as like your rental pool or like your, the, the appreciation of the houses, like the, 
if you in those states there's still possible to get cash flow like where you're not like in the coastal cities like la or new york so you can still get cash flow and there's a potential for a huge appreciation in the next five to ten years you know so i'm not sure i'm not that's all speculation but it's a like the numbers from what people explain to me it makes sense you know where you want to get oh, yeah. get appreciation mm -hmm. and cash flow at the same time you know yeah, so. you want to try to tap into the emerging markets markets that are you know kind of right at the bottom on the way up yeah. or not necessarily on the bottom but definitely on the way up and you you see the development happening or like there you, you know the city's investing in yeah. infrastructure right yeah. Yeah. like that's where you want to get in on so and i've heard a lot about the growth around like orlando central florida like tampa orlando you know that whole area um jacksonville i know a lot of people like invest jacksonville yep yeah i would never live in orlando miserable yeah. place but <laughs> being from florida yeah but i do burn in kahului and lahaina mm -hmm. on the nice. right deal there's still <laughs> even if you're not in a, a cash flow market you can still find like nice cash flow deals so um but you gotta work harder, right? Yeah, you gotta work hard for that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, for jumping on. Um, Daniel, before we leave, man, thank you so much for uh, all yeah, the man. the knowledge and the the tips you shared in in today and last week. Um, it's got me really thinking and like spinning with ideas, you know. And uh, that's never that could be good or bad sometimes when my head starts running. Um, but thank you for, for sharing everything. And I guess, uh, everybody, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Um, if you need anything, always reach out in the Facebook group and we're going to hang out for a little while. Like we always do a talk story and stuff, um, for a few minutes. And if you guys want to stay on, feel free to stay on. Other than that, we'll see you guys next week. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate it, man. Hey, if you want to get invested, I mean, you want to get started, Corey, let me know, man. So, <laughs> Dude, I think, yeah, pretty soon. I, I, I'm gonna sh I was going to show you guys my little packet, appraisal packet, but I can show oh. it to you really quick right now. And then, like, you'll see, like, the numbers in India, like, it's like, you just like, and this is like normal, like, investing kind of like things. But if you want to just take a real quick look at it, I can show it to you right now. Yeah. Shucks, you should have. Oh, hopefully, everybody. Oh, we still got a good amount of people on. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Let's see. I love seeing the, the economics behind the deal. Yep. So this is like the pack that I packet I give like my appraiser. It's basically like a I want to give them like a little showing of okay, this is what I did. Like because you don't know what's gonna look like when the tenants are there, right? So this is like the newly renovated house, and then just like how much money I put into it, and just like a quick breakdown. But I mean like Person in the like brand new kitchen is thirty seven hundred, brand new bathroom is twenty five hundred for the whole thing, you know, and like paint the inside and the outside of my house is forty five hundred. I mean, so like it's I mean just like that just hey, kind of give you know, like the, the price Did point. You, do your contractors want a job in Maui? You know what? I seriously thought I was like, you know what? If I were to fly them over from Indianapolis and have them Holy work, God. it would be cheaper than for me to just pay the the contractors over here. Like it literally would make more sense. I just like yeah. They gotta house them in the house. I mean, they like that. I mean, there's, but they like, if I do an Airbnb, that, that cost goes up high, you know, hotels. But if they live in the house, it would be super cheap for them, I mean, to, to whatever, to get them to do it, you know. And this, I mean, like, the, yeah, the, well, they have to quarantine in the house, anyways, right? We were just talking about that because we're looking at a deal on Kauai and we don't really have a crew there. So I was gonna send my crew and just have them quarantine in the house we're flipping and have Lowe's deliver everything. No, that's, I mean, like, that's, I, I seriously was, this, I was trying to run numbers to see, like, what would it take to just, hey, fly to, like, my house, like, uh, to Hawaii for, like, a month and just bang this out, you know, I mean, like, because, like, but then the materials are also cheaper in, like, the materials these, are going to be more expensive here, yeah, that's the thing, but really, it'll probably yeah. still save money. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, I just, like, the, I mean, like, the, the, the prices are just kind of crazy, like, you just look at this, I mean, like, the, that's insane, 28 grand. Insane. You sp 28 grand on the whole house is basically like what we spend on the kitchen. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, like, I got my exterior painted 
and the interior and that's like all the trim everything right for 4500 yes. I mean, this is my pm fee included so like this this 28 includes my property on I my mean, project manager fee i mean this the miscellaneous repairs are basically basically free i mean uh so yeah and that's why i mean like when i came to hawaii i was like damn these prices are expensive man I'm trying to like renovate a house in hawaii <laughs> right yeah if you're not used to the price the num like the the dollar signs here it's like it's sticker shock you know you get the sticker price shock but then like so this is a, a, a quick pack i mean just just kind of show you guys like my like actual price and these are not like i'm not getting a deal these are like medium these are like my this are the cheap contractor the medium contractor and the high-end contractor that my project manager can use this is a medium medium guy like it's possible to get cheaper work i mean like i don't know if you're using like illegal immigrants or whatever but i mean like the this is like a this is like my average like a decent like contractor work i think you know and so and you and had this to the appraise appraiser to help them yeah so i just because like i'm like i bought this house this one i bought for like 47 grand and i'm trying to get appraised for like 120 you know i'm like why like they're like and i just i just bought like a few months ago so they're like why am i gonna appraise this thing at like so much higher you know and so i like i want to justify their decision okay like this is what we actually did you know trying to get this number as high as possible for them, you know, just to see, but I mean, it is what it is. And then just like a short thing about the neighborhood, some flips, and I give them like three solid comps, like in the, like easily for them to see. And so I don't know if you can see this, but like my subject property is here. And then I give them like the, so the biggest thing for them is like a square footage in the bed bath count. And these were like, at the time they were like recently sold within the past few months. And so just kind of give them like, Hey, here's a short little packet to kind of like, you don't have to do a lot of work and if you want to use these three comps these are like the these like really like legitify my my airv that i'm trying to shoot for for whatever it is you know and so that's kind of like a a little packet just to like so like maybe if they're lazy they don't do as much work or they can justify a higher airv versus like just join starting from scratch on their own you know so mm -hmm. that's kind of like my my little that's thing awesome. I did you create this kind of template yourself because it's clean bro I yeah love it. well i mean i had i had actually like i paid uh, like uh yeah, I mean, like, uh, I had, like, a, a friend who does some, like, a little bit of, like, you know, like, stuff here and there. So, like, I, I just gave him, like, a little bit of cash. And, hey, can you, like, make this pretty for me or something? You know, so. That's awesome. Yeah, because yeah, that's so valuable. If, if, you just, if you just get the appraiser involved, like, you just got to cross your fingers, you know, and just ho hold your breath and hope that the value's coming. Because you never know. Like you said, that guy was half. He, he was at 50% of the, the actual value, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So you got to... And these are like legit, you know what I mean? They're like, they were recently sold like a month or two months ago. And then like the... So I mean, it's not like I'm pulling the the, the number out of my butt, you know? It's like, hey, like I was trying to get this thing to, for, to a place for 120. And so like it's... I mean, it's very, very reasonable as far as like the my stuff, you know? We went about cheap. Yeah. And yeah, we I, I thought you guys would appreciate these numbers over here, though. <laughs> yeah i know that's crazy like we can't influence the appraisers but like this isn't it you're you're kind of just showing this is the work i did yeah right this is how much you know, you, they say you can't influence them but honestly you can i mean like i like the, i have my project manager walk the the property with them and then i mean i don't know if it's, it's like good or bad but like he's real friendly real like a charming guy you know and like just talk about the work they did and the, the neighborhood and just in general you know to i mean just Cause then like appraiser is like a, it's objective and subjective, right? And so like if they're having a bad day or they don't like you, it's super easy for them to just go choosing a lower end of like whatever the spectrum is going to be, you know? Yeah. So, uh, it's just, yeah. You know, and, like, everybody, when it comes to valuations, like everybody's kind of just throwing darts with one hand over their eyes, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Kind of we're, we're, we're throwing it at a target because we see the target. There's a range, right? With the comps. But like you're kind of just th closing your eyes and throwing it and see to a certain like, extent, yeah. But yeah, like it, it, everybody sees values differently, but they're supposed to follow a certain you know pattern. I mean, but what I what I like I mean like you we we're not allowed to influence them, but yeah. there's nothing wrong with giving them something like this. You know yeah. what I mean? It yeah. you can help them, which in a, cer a certain case is influencing them. But at the end of the day it's their license on the line right so they have to put their own valuations yeah. but you want to give them logical you know reasons to show yeah like what you did. because they don't know how much you spent right like how much you actually spent on that um renovation i can't believe that 28 grand one thing to keep in mind um 
when I, so I, I, I was an appraiser from 2003 until like 2007. And I got people give me, I mean, almost every appraisal I went to, they're handing me comps, right? Most of the time, I just kind of tossed them in the trash, never looked at them. Because what happened to me a lot, at least back in this time, to everything has changed as a whole nother industry now, but like, I, people would give me comps that were so ridiculous that, you know, it's just like, I'm, and now actually things are a lot different too, because I think the average person understands comps a lot better now. Whereas back then, you know, in Miami, for example, somebody would be appraising a house. I'd be appraising the house in, in, um, little Havana. Right. And they would give me a comp that was across eighth street, Calle Ocho, which is like a major artery that divides very low end affordable houses from very high end houses and Coral Gables. And they're giving me like five comps from Coral Gables across the street that are like a million. And I'm like, sorry, but your house is still worth 300. Um, and so I don't know, maybe something just to keep in mind when you do provide the appraiser with information is um, how you present it to him to make sure that he realizes that you're not just giving him some bogus stuff to try to get right. a value that's not really there. That's a good point. I think a lot of newer investors, they don't understand how to get the ARVs. And so they'll just take three highest in like this, in the vicinity of like a mile and say, these are not yeah. things to get to this guy. But I mean, uh, the square footage is way different, the style of the home or it's not the intersection where it's like, it's in a different neighborhood. And so like, it's, uh, I mean, as an investor, like your ARV is super important. I mean, so like the, you can't justify a comp that's not actually there, you know? So when you're doing your, trying to talk to your appraiser, it has to be a justifiable like comp that like, uh, that makes sense. Or like uh, in, in Maui, at least, and I'm sure on other islands, ocean view, right? Like if you're looking at a house in Kula, you have a house that has no view at all versus a house that has a wide open, unobstructed by coastal view. It's like you see a significant value increase for that. So it's something that, and it's not always obvious, you know, in MLS, they should check what the view was, but sometimes you can't really tell as much. So you can help the appraiser by getting that kind of information. Hey, hey Greg, what, uh, when's your guys' next deal? You guys got any deals coming up? You and Brandon? You got one for us? We're looking. <laughs> well, uh, we're working on a few. We, we don't have anything on, in contract right now. Oh, yeah? Okay. Nice. Yeah. But I just got a call, actually, um, that our neighbor um, – so my neighbor wants to talk to me about selling his property. So I'm going to have a chat with him. Might be a good CPR kind of development project. It's like four acres, I think, of vacant land. Nice. Um, we're, we were talking about that uh, back in the day of appraisals, yeah, when it was like kind of the Wild West. So Scott uh, – Scott's been in the business for a long time, you know, since those times. And I forget, what'd you call it, Scott? The, well, they were referred to as ninja loans, right, before? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Ninja loans. Yep. Well, the, I mean, yeah, no income, no job. Right, yeah. exactly. They were, li they were called liar loans. You know, they had no doc loans, 700 credit scores. If you showed nothing, they give you 100% financing. Pure the greed. And yeah, five, six, five, sixty credit scores. That would make life so much easier. <laughs> hey, right? <laughs> the state of incomes where beauticians own six houses. Well, you know what? Um, as as strict as the regulations have, you know, came out with Dodd Frank and or, uh, yeah, Dodd Frank and all. You know, it's so hard now. Like Layla and I had, we got our license. You know, the NMLS license it's so much more intense, you know, it's like so many regulations on the conventional side, but I really think that um, through this COVID thing that that has been saving us because people have, you know, people who have mortgages are, it's, it's healthier, you know, they're healthy, they're healthy borrowers. So I think it was a, it was a really necessary thing at the time, you know, it's crazy because, is looking back, it's it's hard to believe 
they used to do that. You know, they were doing that, just giving people money and taking mortgages, knowing that they can't afford it. But Scott, you got any anything going on? Yeah, actually, I just got off the phone. We have got Corey doesn't even know about it. I'm able to do ground up now, up to two million dollars. Anyone with experience, I'm getting more details on it, but it looks like fifty percent of the land, so it is starting to open up. I just had a negotiate with one of my capital partners, so we're doing it together. So next week I'll have a lot more details. So that's yeah, great news. On the land, that's only if it's a land, right? Yeah, land up. Yeah, ground up. Right, but what if they have construction hold back with they, or if they have permits and it's shovel ready? I'm not what sure is, yet, Cor. These are. Th I just got off the phone, so I just wanted to give you a little bit. I'll get all the information for next week. That's good to know. Ground up is coming back. That's hard to. That's. Now I'm trying to wonder how how is it coming back right now when the market's kind of really unstable. I wonder. They did say that they could knock down the existing and build up from there. Mm. So, okay. I don't know if the permits are required. I'm sure they are. Or if they're getting in place in Hawaii, I know it takes forever. To is get it permits, two, but. two million is the cap? Yeah, at this point, but there could get an exception on it if need be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of hard in Hawaii because two million, that's like you could maybe that's buying the land and building like two houses might get you to two million already, you know, and usually right. build to profit, you need to build at least two. Um, if you're building one ground up, I mean, it depends on what you get the land price for, but usually it doesn't work or it's not worth it. You know, it's not worth it to make a hundred grand on a ground up construction project in Hawaii because there's the holding time is so long. Right. So it's just not, it's going to be a case, it's going to be a case by case basis. So I can probably get exceptions, but I, I'm giving the bare minimums. Right. Well, we also have, um, I'm going through, like, as Kiko mentioned, um, we're, we're refinancing our, uh, a couple of our development projects and um, we're getting, you know, good leverage. It's looking like 85% of the purchase, hundred percent of the construction costs. So, um, which was surprising, but I had to go to uh, one of our other capital partners that we haven't worked for or worked with in a long time, but they said they would do it. So I, we got to see if they would do it if it's they're doing it just because it's you know we've had a relationship with them or if they would do that for you know our clients as well and then we can you know fund those deals i don't know alex if you're on the line still but i think you would know alexander mr alexander he's probably taking a call right now <laughs> all right guys i want to see uh i don't know where kiko went kind of bounced but daniel are you do you have any other no uh deals out in indianapolis that you're about to burr uh nothing right now yeah so how many deals how many how many doors do you think you gotta have to hit your goal the two million so it depends on what market and then like what whatever cash flow you're you're getting for each door and so like that's a there's a huge spread i mean like the I think, so this is like my projection. It could be very wrong. I think I have a deal in Hawaii that I can, I'm going to get three grand a, a month in cash flow, but we will see. I mean, that's a, it's a, of course it's projected, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that could like go right or wrong, but I mean, that one deal is worth like a lot of little houses in Indy, you know, so. Yeah. Hey, um, is that one on Maui by any chance in Kihei? No, no, it's over here. Oh, okay. Okay. Just making sure we're not uh, bidding against each other there. <laughs> well, I probably, oh, do you have something like with similar numbers, Greg? Oh no, no, no there's nothing on Maui. Oh. No, <laughs> By the way, Greg, Greg, that property you sent me there's a lot of people that love it. Oh, <laughs> just wait, are you just giving me your heads the, up. Uh, I'm not saying who or what. I've got several. I don't tell one from the oh, other. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, you done. That's the one I was referring to. Also, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of people looking at that one. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of yeah, a lot the, of proof a lot of proof of funds letters going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the bank uh, dropped their price pretty low, so I think that's kind of yeah. triggering a lot of excitement. That's so funny because Hawaii is such a small like network, you know, like everybody knows each other. So sometimes we chase the same deals, you know, but 
the the main thing is that you know we look out for one another and we look at each at each other as part potential partners you know when we're in a bind and stuff yeah matter of fact greg i'm going to reach out to one of the people and see if they want to partner up with you on it if they get it so this is yeah. a good possibility all right yeah definitely i'd much rather partner with someone then compete with them and you know either they get it or i get it but we both end up paying more <laughs> well you, you yeah, know you know it. and you know you know who it is yeah all right, all I right. Kinda, yeah i, all I right. figured okay <laughs> all right <laughs> all right thanks that's just one of them but i mean i'm just telling you that's the best one to work with i'll reach out yeah. and find out for sure yeah thanks we're right on guys well we're approaching noon so I got to get back to it. I'm sure everybody's got to get back to it, but have a great weekend guys. And um, we'll see you next week, fourth quarter. Let's finish strong. You know, let's, let's, let's finish out this year as, as strong as we can and start 2021 fresh. Uh, this has been a, a tough year for everybody, but um, you know, hang in there and finish strong and we'll, we'll ride the momentum to 2021 and we'll see you guys next week. And in the Facebook group. Thanks. Hello, Hello everybody. Bye. Thank you, guys.